Broadcasting the information the mainstream media won't touch. This is The Richie Allen Show in association with DavidIcke.com. Introduce our next guest. Now, many of you will have seen him uh, in his appearances or during his appearances on Press TV, on RT, on Fox News and on many others. As I mentioned at the top of the programme, he's a broadcaster and a politician based in Texas. He might say he's no longer a politician, but he did have a credible but ultimately unsuccessful run for the Senate in Delaware back in 2000. He's uh, got a lot to say about US foreign policy, about APAC, about Israel's influence in DC and much more besides. He's in San Antonio, Texas, which sounds like the place to be today. Let's welcome to the programme Mark Dankos. Mark, thanks for taking the call. How are you? Uh, Richie, good to be with you from San Antonio. I guess it's 3.17 in the afternoon here. What time is the GMT now? About five hours ahead? Well, we're actually six hours because our clocks moved forward an hour on Sunday. So we're back to six hours, Mark. So oh, so we're back to six-hour difference. I wasn't sure. Very good. And we had very San Antonio-esque weather today here in Manchester in England. Very, very nice it was too. Lovely spring day here. Yes. So, so it's really good to have you on. Um, we, we, we will, of course, tweet out details of where people can find you, your blog, where people can read you. There's so much we can uh, get into. Loads of questions for you about APAC about U.S. foreign policy, about Israel, and, uh, and plenty more in the half an hour or 35 minutes that we'll have to chat. But I want to start off asking you about your thoughts on, well, on the U.S. presidential election. This November, this coming November, of course, you will go to the polls again to elect the next leader of the free world. What have you made of the candidates, Mark, so far, the conduct of them, and how the whole thing has been covered in the media? Well, I think the whole thing is a complete mess in both of the major political parties, and it's quite obvious uh, that when one looks at the situation in both the Republican and Democratic parties, that you see the absolute influence of the Israeli lobby, and it's all right up front. It's not even being uh, quasi-hidden anymore, uh, whether we're talking about the influence of IPAC uh, and the and the uh, acquiescence to uh, its designs that uh, characterize all the different political candidates who appeared there, or we're talking, on the other hand, about a situation where you look at the financing of these elections in the United States and look at some of the major financiers of the different Republican contenders, uh, as well as Hillary Clinton in particular, uh, in the Democratic Party, it's quite obvious what's going on. And when you add to that the disproportionate influence that these folks have in the American news media, they pretty much have a lock in the situation. You have direct experience, Mark, of running when, when you ran for the Senate in 2000. And doing that, I suppose, you got a an up-close and personal look at how campaigns are run, how election races like that are run, and the enormous amount of money poured into them. It must have been a startling experience for you. Well, that's exactly right. And how I got into this... Uh, and I have a recent article that uh, has appeared in the uh, in the internet and in a number of places in the United States that discusses this. I got into this because Howard Phillips, the late Howard Phillips, who was the head of the Conservative Caucus in Washington, D.C., uh, and was also the big wig in the Social Constitution Party at that time, uh, had talked to me about doing this third party run in the U.S. Senate in Delaware against uh, Tom Carper uh, and Bill Roth, the incumbent Republican at that time. And the idea was there that uh, we were actually trying to punish Roth and to punish the globalist wing of the Republican Party uh, for having betrayed uh, the anti-globalist uh, wing of the of the American right. And so I entered the race with a specific desire. Uh, this wasn't known to the public at the time, of course, uh, but I entered that race uh, to ensure uh, that a globalist uh, Republican uh, who is uh, very much affiliated with the usual suspects in Wall Street and the Bush empire and all the rest of it would lose the election uh, and that the Democrats would gain control of the U.S. Senate that year by one seat. Uh, and it's not that I'm in love with the Democratic Party either or their leader. 
tip. Uh, but the idea was to uh, use some brokered influence uh, to punish the the uh, Bush wing of the Republican Party uh, for some past transgressions and uh, for for many uh, sellouts of those people on the American right. Uh, who weren't on board with all of this globalism, uh, who didn't like the fact that American manufacturing jobs were being exported overseas, and uh, at least in some cases, including my own, uh, did not like the disproportionate influence Israel and American foreign policy. I didn't talk about that as much in 2000 as I would have in 2001 and thereafter. I've often thought that if I had been running for the U.S. Senate in 2004 or in 2008, I would have had a much stronger case to make in terms of talking about many of the kinds of things that I routinely talk about in alternative media now and also on press television in Iran. I want to, I want to, we'll talk about, we'll talk more about Israel shortly, but, but I want to ask you about the, the, wide, the widely held belief, at least in the independent media here, and we're a bit more removed from the US election and maybe have a kind of a, a calmer or a cooler eye on it. It's my contention that Hillary Clinton has been preordained as an ex-president of the United States and that what Donald Trump is doing is effectively acting as a sort of a stalking horse for her, blowing up the Republican Party, dis- d- dividing it, even dissolving it to, um, you, you, know, you know, to a certain degree. You've heard this, of course. What do you think of it? Well, I think that uh, there is uh, uh, this very, very easily could prove to be the case. Uh, You know, my late friend Michael Collins Piper uh, wrote an article for the American Free Press that uh, appeared in May of 2011. And it went into a great deal of detail about all the reasons uh, why uh, anti-globalist, anti-Zionist American conservatives uh, ought to be very weary of Donald Trump. Uh, I have talked about this a little bit on a couple of different radio shows, and, and yet it appears that much of the American right that is uh, anti-globalist and that is concerned about the overextension of American military commitments abroad has decided that uh, that they're going to have to go with Trump in this election. And yet when you read Michael Collins Piper's article for the American Free Press, it is online – Uh, The title of the article is Trump Wants to be President. Uh, Piper goes into a great deal of detail about the business and political connections of Donald Trump uh, going back to his earliest days. And uh, this starts getting into all kinds of uh, murky characters uh, ranging from the uh, Central Intelligence Agency in in a front company set up by a former CIA director in Dallas. Uh, something called the Mary Carter Paint Company. Uh, Alan Dulles and the uh, New York Governor Thomas Dewey, who was a leader of the Rockefeller wing of the GOP, were both involved in creating this company as a front organization. They did operate a national paint store chain, but its real purpose, according to Piper, was actually to function as a covert CIA money laundering operation. Well, if you uh, go ahead and read the rest of the article, uh, one discovers that The Mary Carter Paint Company uh, eventually became, uh, through a series of very complicated business deals and mergers and acquisitions and so forth, it eventually became the uh, Resorts International Company uh, that we uh, associate both with Donald uh, Trump uh, and with his gambling empire. And fascinatingly enough, in the Piper article, he goes on to discuss that this name change from the Mary Carter Paint Company to Resorts International uh, was in uh, 1967 or 1968. And when you look at some of the principal uh, investors uh, in this Resorts International company, uh, you're dealing with people like Meyer Lansky, uh, who then was the chairman of the board of the Jewish Crime Syndicate, Uh, David Rockefeller, that's a name that should mean something to your listeners, Uh, the Investors Overseas Service, uh, which linked up to a Bernard Kornfeld, uh, who in turn was linked up with a Burr Rosenbaum, who was the Mossad Swiss-based arms procurer at the time, who headed up a bank to credit international of Geneva, which in turn was linked up with the Meyer Lansky crime syndicate. And Rosenbaum served as, as, Land, as Lansky's chief money launderer in Europe. 
uh, Baron Edmund de Rothschild comes up uh, in this in this operation. William Mellon Hitchcock is another one that Piper names, an heir to the Mellon dynasty, uh, who was very much involved both with Resorts International and with Meyer Lansky and with some of the things that were going on in Atlantic City at that time. And so when you read through uh, this whole history of the Mary Carter Paint Company and both the Central Intelligence Agency and the Meyer Lansky Crime Syndicate, all of this was a basic precursor to the Resorts International Company that was acquired by Donald Trump. And, of course, when we look into Trump's whole family and professional history, uh, he has uh, expressed pro-Zionist views for a long time. Long time. A long, long time. time. Yeah, yeah. He, he, uh, he uh, is very public about the fact that he was a grand marshal some years ago at, a, at uh, an Israel Day parade in New York. His uh, daughter is married to a very key Jewish financier in New York. And, uh, you know, Trump's appearances to the Republican Jewish Institute have him saying a lot of things that are extremely troublesome. Uh, to to people like me, certainly. And then last but least, and I suspect that this is going to come up with some of your listeners too, uh, the things that Trump was saying before the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee in this dog and pony show recently that uh, involved these different presidential candidates was very, very disturbing business because uh, it was an absolute acquiescence uh, to the Zionist agenda all the way across the board, with one exception. Trump did on several occasions make reference to the term Palestine. Uh, what he exactly uh, meant to convey by that is, uh, is a matter of interpretation and discussion. There are people on the American right who believe that Trump is simply trying to appease the Jewish lobby uh, to, to uh, dampen their, their attacks on him in recent times uh, to try and secure the Republican nomination in order to subsequently pursue an independent course after the election if he should get elected. There's another body of thought that suggests exactly what you've suggested, Richie, and that is that uh, Trump has been a stalking horse for uh, Hillary Clinton all along, and that uh, the the anti New World Order, anti Zionist American right uh, is being sucked into something that they don't really understand. Only time is going to tell which of the two it is. But uh, when we go back to that Mike Piper article in uh, May of 2011 in the American Free Press, which would be available online to your listeners, there's some disturbing information there. And uh, I'm reserving judgment on this guy, uh, and I know a number of people on the American right who've decided to throw their weight in with him, but uh, at this particular juncture, he's uh, sending out a lot of mixed smoke signals. Let's just put it that way. It's great to have Mark Dankoff on the line from San Antonio, Texas. It's 30 minutes. Well, it's pretty much half past the hour. It's uh, terrific to have him on the program. I've tweeted out where you can read his blog. He's mentioned the American Free Press as well. We'll tweet out details there where you can read articles there. Mark, effectively, and this is kind of horrifying, really, in, in terms of it's horrifying to, to kind of have to come to terms with this. But all, all of the United States' recent presidents, going back to Carter, going back to Ford, we can tie them pretty much directly to the Central Intelligence Agency, can't we? Uh, yes, we can, and uh, it's not an accident that when you look at the influence of the Israeli lobby, uh, it is the same Michael Collins Piper in his book Final Judgment that uh, is a terrific book, by the way, on the Kennedy assassination and makes a compelling case uh, for the role of the Israeli Mossad in, in what happened in the events in Dallas uh, here in Texas in 1963. That may sound like a very strange thesis until one looks uh, at all of the links that Piper uh, is able to demonstrate between Meyer Lansky and David Ben-Gurion uh, and the uh, Israeli nuclear program that uh, John Kennedy wanted brought under international inspection at the time and um, the elements in the anti-Castro movement and in the Central Intelligence Agency and in various organized crime syndicates who had a number of demonstrable reasons not to like John Kennedy. And uh, when Piper makes a good case for the fact that uh, Israel had more than a passing interest uh, in Kennedy's removal for a couple of reasons, one was his uh, dispute that we can now read about in a number of places with David Ben-Gurion uh, over the whole issue of this 
uh, Demona nuclear plant uh, that uh, Ben Gurion told Kennedy at the time was nothing more than a water desalinization plant. Kennedy knew from the Air Force Technical Applications Center, uh, the Air Force Intelligence Agency that was running these U-2 flights over that Demona plant, that uh, he was being lied to by the Prime Minister. Uh, this is all discussed in Piper's book, by the way. Uh, the long and the short of it is that that was a uh, major factor, I believe, in what happened to John Kennedy. There are two other things that constantly come up in this Kennedy business as well. It is a matter of record that both John Kennedy and his brother Robert, who was the Attorney General of the United States at that time, uh, wanted to bring the precursor to APAC or IPAC, known as the American Zionist Council, uh, the auspices of the Foreign Agents Registration Act which would have recognized uh, that the American Zionist Council was the agent of a foreign power and would have brought them under the same kind of scrutiny uh, that other uh, foreign lobbying organizations are, are brought under in terms of this so-called Foreign Agents Registration Act. Uh, after the demise of Kennedy, uh, it was very clear that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, the American Zionist Council, in effect, kind of osmosed into the Is American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Lyndon Johnson pursued an absolutely pro-Zionist uh, agenda during his presidency, as did virtually every American president thereafter in both of the major political parties. The other thing that comes up with John Kennedy is there is, has been talk for years, and Mike Piper addresses this in his book, Final Judgment, on exactly what uh, John Kennedy's intentions were and what John Kennedy's father's intentions were when Jack was first elected to the presidency uh, about getting rid of the Federal Reserve Board and bringing American monetary policy back where it belongs. Yeah, I was just going to bring that up. I was just going to bring head. that up, yeah. Yes. So so we think there may... Well, we know George H.W. Bush was in Texas, even though he remains the only man alive at the time of the Kennedy murder to claim that he doesn't remember where he was, Mark. The only guy in history who was alive when Kennedy was shot, who says he doesn't remember where he was. Well, we know George H.W. Bush was in Dallas. So we think that some of the shooters who, who, who shot at Kennedy when they had him in, uh, in, in the crosshairs, they had him, you know, whether, whether they were on the overpass, whether there was somebody in a manhole cover, some of those shooters may very well have been Israeli Secret Service agents. I had heard... And I've spoken to people like Jim Mars many times over the years. Yes. That some of those were, one of them was supposed to be from Eastern Europe and one was supposed to have been from France. But that, of course, doesn't mean that they wouldn't have had any ties to Mossad. Yes, well, uh, in, uh, in terms of this whole situation, uh, Piper presents a uh, ca compelling case in his book uh, for a French connection to at least uh, some of the shooters and that that French connection uh, actually ties up with Israel uh, in terms of the uh, OA, French uh, OAS organization, which had been trying to assassinate de Gaulle. And uh, where French and Israeli connection uh, apparently uh, first uh, rears its head is in terms of the whole situation that involved uh, the Algerian independence movement, uh, which uh, had the French OAS wanting to assassinate de Gaulle because he wanted to give Algeria back to the Algerians. And uh, Jack Kennedy, if you go back to his time at the U.S. Senate, as Piper outlines this, was supportive of the Algerian independence movement as well. And uh, so there, in fact, was an element in the French military and in the French intelligence community uh, that did not like Jack Kennedy because of this whole Algerian situation. And, of course, uh, Israel, as Piper uh, demonstrates this, uh, was absolutely opposed to what de Gaulle wanted to do in Algeria, fearing that it would open up the whole question of uh, Arab uh, independence movements in other places, uh, both in, in Africa and elsewhere, uh, that would be extremely prob problematic for Israel down the road. To be that as it may, I think where the Kennedy assassination is concerned, uh, there are a number of things that we can say at a bare minimum. Uh, one is, of course, I'm very familiar with Jim Mars, very familiar with some of the other fine researchers uh, that have been investigating the Kennedy assassination for years, ranging from Mars and Anthony Summers to Michael Collins Piper and David Lifton. And uh, certainly when one reads all of the information that these various people present, some are stronger in some areas than others. But I think it's obvious that Jack Kennedy was the victim of a conspiracy, uh, 
that the Warren Commission was a deliberate cover-up of the truth, uh, that Kennedy was, in fact, caught in a crossfire uh, on Elm Street in Dallas, that we have all kinds of discrepancies between the observations of the Parkland Hospital doctors in Dallas at the time uh, and what subsequently uh, was the verdict of this uh, military-supervised uh, autopsy of Mr. Kennedy at the Bethesda Naval Hospital in, in Maryland, uh, where you had a military physician supervising that autopsy who was not even a forensic pathologist. Uh, I had a personal conversation years ago face-to-face -face with a guy that took the autopsy x-rays and photographs of Kennedy's body at the time. He was one of two men that was involved in that process. Uh, he assured me that what he saw that day, and he, of course, would never forget it, did not coincide at all with the artist's representations of, of alleged artist's representations of what those autopsy photographs and x-rays that he took actually showed. So the Warren Commission itself never actually saw the actual autopsy x-rays and photographs uh, that Mr. Reed and his uh, colleague uh, Gerald Cutler took that day. And, and had they seen the actual x-rays and photographs, it would have revealed that Mr. Kennedy, in fact, was hit from in front as well as behind, that he was hit by multiple shots. Multiple and that, in shots. Fact, there, and that there had been a crossfire. Yeah, there was, um, a guy, there was a guy even down a manhole. There was a guy at street level, wasn't there, who, who basically fired the, uh, the fatal shot. I've never believed that the fatal shot came from the grassy knoll. I believe it came from a manhole cover on the street about 30, 40 feet in front of the car. But I do want to, it's 23 minutes to the top of the hour. Time flies, Mark, when we're talking about these subjects. And I'm really glad you're on. But um, I, I don't want to spend too much time on Kennedy. We yes. can certainly get you back on in the future to talk about Kennedy because it's obvious that um, you're very um, much um, briefed, very well briefed and very well researched on Kennedy. But we've got some terrific questions coming in from our listeners on Twitter. And here's one that we debate sometimes on this program. What about I mean, first of all, folks, we, we've, we've been talking about some extraordinary things here. Every president since Kennedy has very strong connections to the intelligence agencies, the CIA, the NSA maybe, and, and others, and certainly the Israeli Secret Service. This is incredible stuff, and it's all true, and it's all demonstrably provable. Now, on that, Martin asks this on Twitter. Do you think, Mark, that every president is compromised and that child abuse is a part of this? Uh, I think every American president in my lifetime has been compromised to a greater or lesser extent uh, by uh, many demonic forces in the world, including the Israeli lobby, including the banking community, the central international central banking cabals, uh, including the secret societies, uh, and, and certainly in, including um, – uh, the armaments manufacturers and ma manufacturers and all of the other usual suspects who who uh, own these elections and who are able to uh, basically control news media coverage about what's going on. In terms of this child abuse question, uh, is if that's referring to pedophilia? Pedophilia uh, specifically, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, I've I, in recent years have come across a number of articles uh, dealing with this particular subject uh, involving high-ranking politicians, both uh, in the uh, in the United States and in Britain, and it seems to me that uh, that these things cannot be discounted. Now, I'm trying to remember specifically the name of a guy. I'm going to see if I can bring it up in my studio here while we're talking who had a, a very credible uh, presentation that appeared in the Washington Times years ago that implicated some very high-ranking officials, both in the Reagan and the Bush administrations, uh, and, uh, and they, they were alleged to have been uh, involved in a pedophilia ring. And uh, there was some publicity on this one time in the Washington uh, Times, and then it was you're, never um, you're uh, thinking of You're thinking of John DeCamp. You're thinking yes. of John DeCamp, that's right. That's and the guy, that's the guy's name, that's it. The Franklin scandal, the Franklin Credit Union scandal and the, the removal of boys from a, from a, from a home uh, in Nebraska and those boys basically taken around the country on airplanes and abused at pedophile parties around the country. One of the guys involved in it was a guy called Lawrence E. King and he was an incredibly high... Uh, high up uh, Republican power broker. In fact, he was um, he was the he, I suppose he was 
at one time he was one of the most powerful African American men in in the country, and he had the ear of some of um, Ronald Reagan's closest advisors. And at one time he sang the national anthem at the Republican convention, and this guy was an absolute serial child abuser. Yeah, John De Camp, that was the guy. Yeah. That's the guy. I remember the name now. And, of course, if people uh, listening to this show should type in Reagan, Bush, and pedophilia and just search Google or whatever search engine they happen to use, uh, there are just reams of information that come out on this. And uh, I, I am compelled to believe that, in fact, some of this information is true. How much of it, we don't know. But this dovetails with other things that – uh, don't necessarily involve pedophilia that have involved major cover-ups uh, of the activities of politicians for a long time in regard to sort of things in their personal life. Uh, for example, we'll just take one example for the listeners because I think it illustrates a larger point. The whole question of Jack Kemp, the longtime New York congressman, uh, ex-Buffalo Bills football quarterback in the old American Football League. After he got out of professional football, uh, he did an, a political internship of some type in the Ronald Reagan uh, gubernatorial White House in California when Reagan was governor. And then uh, subsequently, Jack Kemp was later elected to the United States Congress in New York, uh, very much uh, uh, the darling of the establishment right in the Republican Party, the neoconservative right Republican Party. And in 1988, when George Herbert Walker Bush uh, was nominated by the Republicans to run against Michael Dukakis, all of the available rumors that were going on at that time were tapping Jack Kemp to be Bush's running mate. Uh, that didn't happen. Bush went with Dan Quayle. A lot of people were, uh, re the, the reactions ranged from simply being surprised to being shocked that Quayle was picked. But uh, lo and behold, that fall in 1988, before the, before the general election, the uh, uh, soft porn magazine uh, Penthouse ran a story on Jack Kemp in his entire history, uh, his entire personal life history that had allegedly come out in these Secret Service background checks on Kemp where uh, what was allegedly discovered uh, made Kemp uh, too hot to touch in terms of uh, having him on Bush's ticket, and so he uh, subsequently was passed by. Uh, and, and this uh, also gets into Bob Dole, who was the Republican nominee for president in 1996. And interestingly enough, Jack Kemp was Dole's running mate that year because no one else want, wanted to run with Dole. They knew that the Dole ticket was going to lose, and it came out the day after the election that uh, Dolan Kemp and Bill Clinton uh, and uh, Al Gore sat down in the off, I believe it was in the offices of the Washington Post, and all of the representatives of the other major uh, Eastern media outlets were there, where there was an agreement among the, uh, the, the uh, candidates and among their camps that there would be absolutely no discussion of personal lives uh, of, of any of the candidates. And the media signed off to this silent agreement that uh, was not publicized until the day after the election on the front page of the Washington Post, which would explain how Dole could risk having Kemp on the ticket. It would also explain something that was never exposed to the general public, uh, except in the newsletter of the Conservative Caucus put out by Howard, the late Howard Phillips at the time. And that was that uh, Bob Dole, some years before, had uh, gotten a campaign worker pregnant and had used his chief of staff, Craig Fuller, uh, to uh, transport this pregnant campaign worker to Kansas City, Missouri, uh, where she was operated on by an uh, secretly operated on by an abortionist whose name, as I remember, was Dr. William Christ. And uh, this whole thing was published in the uh, Conservative Caucus newsletter in Washington, D.C. Uh, it was on the uh, Mr. Phillips' own personal newsletter at the time, something called the Howard Phillips Issues and Strategy Bulletin. And uh, yet none of the major media picked up on it. And some of these establishment conservative groups, including the National Right to Life Organization, uh, endorsed Bob Dole uh, and did not look into any of these allegations at all uh, that were quite credible based upon the, the sources that were publishing them. And uh, Howard Phillips had a simple explanation for that at the time, and that was that the National Right to Life Foundation, as I recall this, had gotten something like $985,000 in payment 
uh, directly from the Republican National Committee. And the conclusion that Phillips drew at the time from all of that, and he published it, was that it was basically hush money uh, to keep the national right to life people and some of the other uh, traditional uh, so-called cultural conservatives in the Republican Party absolutely silent about both Dole and Jack Kemp. So uh, this this sort of thing has gone on for years, I'm sure, in both of the major political oh, yeah. parties, not just involving what we might term, for lack of a better uh, term, conventional misconduct, if there is such a thing. But, uh, you know, certainly when you start getting into pedophilia, uh, you're dealing with uh, absolutely, uh, without a question, criminal conduct that no sane person should justify or defend or, f- or fail to expose. And well, you know, know, you know, on you know, on that, Mark. I mean, there's a couple of things that are worth mentioning. You know, an entry point for this for anybody who, you know, who is new to this, the the levels of paedophilia in in government, in in public life, and in in industry is, you know, a great entry point is David Icke's book, The Biggest Secret, which was published in 1998, which named Edward Heath, he named Leon Britton. Uh, he named a number of people, including George H.W. Bush, as uh, as paedophiles, and he backed it up in his book, David Did, with evidence. And that's a good entry point into it. I have been asked, Mark, to, to give more information on the Franklin Credit Union scandal and what happened there. And I must get um, Nick Bryant back on the programme, because Nick wrote a book called The Franklin Scandal, and it's the definitive read on what happened in Omaha, Nebraska, and what Lawrence E. King, the big Republican power broker, was doing there. It's the Franklin scandal, and you can find it online at any good online retailer. Basically, Lawrence E. King, this guy who I mentioned, this big Republican power broker, he was running a credit union, the Franklin Credit Union in Omaha, Nebraska. What he was doing with, with, some, of the, with some of the money that was, was saved with, that was lodged with that credit union, was he was basically running a paedophile ring that involved very, very well-known citizens in in Nebraska, but also high-level U.S. politicians across the board, not just, as Mark was saying, in the Republican Party, but in the Democratic Party as well. It was um, extraordinary what was going on. And this, John DeCamp was the first guy to raise the alarm about this. World in Action, an ITV documentary, which which is commercial television in England, World in Action made, I think it was World in Action, it might not have been, uh, a documentary was made about this and the documentary was cancelled just before it was due to air on ITV here in England. One of the biggest customers of Lawrence E. King is believed to have been in the early 1980s, as David Icke would call him, Father George Bush. That's George H.W. Bush. And you know, Mark, what's absolutely extraordinary here is it's not even anecdotal evidence. It is overwhelming evidence that exists to to uh, to prove that George H.W. Bush, the 41st or the 42nd president, or the, the 41st, I reckon, president of the United States of America, was a notorious paedophile, and he was untouchable. <coughs> well, that's exactly right. <coughs> Excuse me, when you look at the untouchable character of all of this, uh, just going back to uh, what we've now been able to reconstruct through public records that have been obtained by, uh, obtained by Freedom of Information Act lawsuit, uh, uh, the uh, George Herbert Walker Bush uh, it, uh, is is the individual who was the liaison bet- at the time between the Central Intelligence Agency and the FBI in terms of what both of those agencies were doing in their so-called in, uh, uh, work uh, in investigating the Kennedy assassination for the Warren Commission. Uh, and, of course, this is the same Mr. Bush who claimed he wasn't involved in that role and wasn't in Dallas at the time and so forth and so on. And when you look at this, uh, some of this information uh, that has come out on Mr. Bush in regard to these uh, sordid allegations of pedophilia, it basically mirrors what's been going on out there in the last year or so or two with Bill Clinton and Alan Dershowitz, uh, who is a big name in the uh, Israeli lobby and a big time, uh, of course, attorney. Uh, and this whole business of Jeffrey Epstein and this so-called pedophile island. Uh, the American Free Press has run a story on this. Breitbart has run a story on it. Uh, 
uh, several stories on it, uh, the Washington Examiner, and so forth and so on. So if people get into this whole business of researching either George Bush, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, or Bill Clinton on this issue of uh, pedophilia, uh, there are a lot of very, very distinct things that are going to come up. And the fascinating thing, of course, in terms of these latest allegations about Mr. Clinton and these alleged pedophiliac activities uh, are linked up. He's, he's linked up in these activities with people like Alan Dershowitz and uh, Jeffrey Epstein. And uh, one does not have to be a real genius to see the connections between those individuals and the Israeli lobby and the banking community. So, well, of course, uh, um, it's it's important you mentioned Epstein, of course, who is a is, who is a convi- who is a convicted uh, pedophile. Yes, um, and and that's really important. Um, I've never heard um, Dershowitz's name mentioned, and I've got to say. Um, Dershowitz has never been investigated. He's never been asked any questions about uh, paedophilia. So just in the interest of fairness and, ba- and balance, he's not here to uh, to defend himself. Um, but yes. Epstein, Epstein, obviously, and uh, what, why Clinton, um, why Clinton, you know, would feel that he doesn't have to answer questions about whether or not he was present at any underage sex parties hosted by Jeffrey Epstein. Well, you know, Bill Clinton you know, should, but by all means, you know, under no circumstances should the office that he held preclude him from co- cooperating in an investigation into what Jeffrey Epstein was doing. It's outrageous that Clinton would say, I'm not going to answer questions. Again, Clinton may not have taken part in anything himself, but if he knows anything, or if he knew what Epstein was doing, and Epstein was a friend and a donor, um, you would, um, you know, he, he's he's absolutely obliged to to cooperate with that investigation, Mark. Well, that's absolutely correct, and uh, and that uh, gets into the whole basic question that Paul Craig Roberts has been uh, writing some very effective uh, articles on recently, and that is raising the question as to whether or not anyone can say that America is uh, any longer a country ruled by law, uh, whether America is any longer, in any sense, a constitutional republic. Uh, or whether or not it has ceased to be any of those things. And when you combine uh, the kind of obviously protected status of some of these powerful people uh, from what uh, would be criminal investigations and presumably criminal indictments for most of the rest of us, and you add to that uh, the the way in which these elections have been financed in the United States, especially uh, with these last two Supreme Court decisions that have been made in campaign finance, You look at who it is that controls the news media in the United States. And then last but not least, as Dr. Roberts has brought up many times, uh, Pat Buchanan has been a very effective spokesman on the right in this regard, along with some very, very compelling people on the American left. The whole issue of the development of the American domestic police state in this country, especially since uh, 9-11, the so-called U.S. Patriot Acts, the NSA warrantless surveillance been going on, the Military Commissions Act of 2006, and last but not least, the draconian details that are in this so-called uh, uh, National uh, Defense Authorization Act bill that uh, uh, properly understood and, and, and argued this way by Mr. Obama's own Justice Department supposedly gives him the authority to order the targeted assassination of Americans uh, uh, who uh, he has determined or our intelligence community has determined are quote-unquote terrorists or cooperating with terrorists. Whatever happened to habeas corpus in this country, right? Whatever happened to the Bill of Rights, whatever happened to due process of law, the the presumption of innocence until proven guilty, all of a sudden you have everything going on now from warrantless break-ins, warrantless surveillance, targeted assassinations, and of course it should surprise anyone uh, that a country that is supporting the kinds of draconian and horrible things that we have been supporting in the Middle East, that we have supported in Ukraine, uh, the increased militarization of American uh, foreign policy without justification in Eastern Europe, uh, up to and including, of course, in the Middle East and in and in Africa and in the Indian subcontinent, uh, continent, this, uh, these drone strikes that have killed scores of innocent people. I mean, you're looking at that kind of foreign policy, I think Thomas Jefferson and James Madison would remind us 
that a government doing those kinds of things abroad is quite likely to be the same government that becomes increasingly draconian uh, in its attitudes and its practices toward its own population. And, and that's clearly what's going on here. We are, are d- dealing with terrifying developments in the United States in the last 15 years, especially. And what is especially disturbing to me and a number of my colleagues in alternative media is the number of Americans who are comatose and who have not yet figured this well, thing out. But, but we're waking them up one by one. That's a terrific place to leave it. We've got to get out because yes. the program is just over. Mark, you can be found, folks, I've already tweeted out Mark's blog, but just Google or use another search engine and find Mark Dankoff's America and you'll find out more about him there. Regular contributor to Press TV and American Free Press. Mark, I really enjoyed it. Do come back again soon and we'll get into more of these issues with more time. Hey, thank you very much, and people might enjoy my interview with Kouros Zib on Israel and 9-11 or my research on the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. All of that's available online. Mark, a pleasure. Thank you very much. Mark Dankoff on the line to us there from San Antonio in Texas.